Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Jody Chiera. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the topic of full swing versus short game. Uh, I'm going to take you through some of the differences that we see in the data that we get in our K-Code software, uh, most specifically the graphs. Uh, one of the, the main differences we see in the kinematic sequence graph, which we know are rotational velocities, and then what are the differences we see in the body orientation graphs, the bend, the side bends, and the rotations of our players when we're trying to get them to produce a swing that generates power versus a swing that generates more control, and then, mo and then most extreme on the other side would be a swing that we're trying to generate finesse, right? So we're gonna go through those differences, I'm going to talk to you about what I look for in data, you know, and then we're going to go into some very simple biofeedback that you can do to help minimize the confusion with your player on what they should be doing throughout the swing, especially to control more of a, or produce more of a control shot, like a distance wedge, and then your finesse shots would be like your pitches and your flop shots. So we're going to talk about those differences and then what I use in biofeedback. And then I'm going to show you some, some differences that you might see because we have sensors that go on the upper arm as well as the wrist, right? So there's some things you have to pay attention to depending upon where your sensor placement is. Wrist angles become very important when we talk about short game, but there might be some differences that you see in the, in the kinematic sequence. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this because short game is actually, I think, in my opinion, one of the ways I use the technology the most with my players, but I also feel that it's the most misunderstood amongst our customer base, and we can really do a lot more with technology or 3D technology when it comes to short game if we just understood kind of a little bit more about what we want to look for in the data as opposed to a full swing shot. So I've got some swings captured. I'm going to walk you through those first. And then I'm going to take questions. So if you have any questions pertaining to the data itself as I'm walking you through it or the differences in the graphs, let's get those questions answered first. Then I'll go in and I'll show you kind of a biofeedback program that I use to really target the control of distance wedges. And I'll tell you a quick story on how powerful that is. And then we'll answer those questions on what you all might want to do at, at, in terms of how to use your biofeedback for short game as well. And then I'll wrap it up with some sensor placement uh, questions, right? So we do have the sensor that would go on the upper arm or the, or the lead wrist. So I want to talk through where those sensors should be when you put them on correctly. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through a couple graphs. So I'm going to turn my camera off here very quickly. And I'm going to walk you through some data. So the first one we're going to look at is a power swing, right? So this is kind of what you are normally accustomed to looking at in your software. Okay, so a couple things. Now, again, there's many directions we can go um, into these graphs, right? There's different things that we all pay attention to that are important to us in coaching. I'm just going to speak to a couple things that are very specific to the differences in a full swing shot and a finesse shot or a control shot, right? So there's just different varying degrees of finesse, right? So the three that I'm going to talk about today is this swing here is a full out, you know, I'm trying to hit a seven iron as far as I can. Then I have a controlled wedge shot that flew 80 yards with a 54 degree wedge. And then I have a pure finesse shot that uh, was a 58 degree wedge that was a, a flop shot, right? It only went about, uh, I'll call it 10, 15 to 20 feet, right? And it would go straight up in the air. So we're going to look at the differences in those. So the main thing I want you to pay attention to today is the sequence of the transition, the acceleration rates of the segments, the peak speed order of the segments, and then the deceleration rates of each segment. Okay, so let me just highlight what I am 
talking about there for anybody that needs a little bit of a refresher. So our transition sequence is if we look at the zero axis, the horizontal zero axis right here, it's the order from left to right that each line is going from below the zero axis to above the zero axis. Now, when we're talking about the kinematic sequence, the zero axis, when we talk about rotational velocities is zero rotational velocity. So that segment at the exact moment that it crosses through that axis is a moment in time that that segment is not moving. It, and it's gone from moving in the direction away from the target, which is below the zero axis to towards the target, which is above the zero axis, okay? So that's why we look at the order in that instance of time when it crosses through that zero axis, okay? So in this particular case, if I zoom in on the transition sequence, which is right in here, Okay, so now I've zoomed in just on the on the transition sequence. So we can see very clearly when I zoom in that the first segment to cross is the pelvis, the second is the torso, the third is the lead arm. Okay, I have this one particularly on the wrist because it's light blue. It would be dark blue if it was on the upper arm. And then I've got the club, fourth. So for a power shot, this is the type of transition that we will normally see. So I want everybody to realize that. And now we're gonna go into the acceleration rate. So I'm gonna go ahead and fit back to view. I'll erase those highlighter marks. Okay, so now, if we look at the acceleration rates, and I zoom in on the acceleration rate phase of the swing, which would be just after the segments cross through the zero axis all the way till the peaks of each segment. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start right about here, and we'll go down, and we'll go all the way over to impact. Okay, so now if I look at the acceleration rates of each segment, I can see very clearly here that the red line is on top of the green line. Okay, so that means that there is stretch between my pelvis and my torso, so I'm loading my core segment in that particular amount of, of frames that the red is on top of the green. So all this white space in here between the red and the green, that's loading of the core. Okay. Then if I go in and I look at the green compared to the light blue, which is my torso compared to my arm, for the entire amount of time that the green's on top of the blue, that's loading of my lead shoulder. So I've got some loading of my lead shoulder. Okay. And then finally, if I look at the light blue, which is my arm or my wrist, relative to the brown, which is my hand, all this white space here is loading of my lead wrist. So in this particular case, for a player that's trying to produce power, I've got good sequential loading of the core, the shoulder, and the wrist. So I'm doing the best job that I can of loading the segments that I, I need to, starting from the lower segments, pelvis to torso, torso to arm, arm to club. Okay, so this would be a good indicator of a player trying to produce power. So let's go back here and look at one last thing. Uh, one thing to note, just kind of like a housekeeping topic is if you truly want to see loading from segment to segment you can take away some segments if you click these boxes down below if i take away the arm and the club now i'm just looking at the pelvis 
and the torso, which would help you kind of focus more in on that particular segment of the body. So if I brought that back on and I wanted to, I could take off the pelvis and take off the, the hand. And now I'm just looking at the interaction between the torso and the arm. Right, so just to kind of help you narrow in your focus there, you can do that. So the final thing that we see typically when we have a player trying to produce power is what we call deceleration rates. Okay, so once these segments reach their peak, how much do those lines fall off before we get to impact? is what we call our deceleration rates okay so this is actually my swing i know for a fact that i don't decelerate very well i actually have a bit of a, a back problem right now so that's probably why we're seeing my torso start to decelerate and then re-accelerate so i'm having you know i have trouble putting the brakes on there of the pelvis and the torso just because of the lower back thing that i'm working through right now um, but if i was able to do that you would see these uh, deceleration rates match more of what the acceleration rates are showing on the other side of the curve. So just be aware of that's what we will typically see when we're talking about a swing that produces power. Okay. A couple other things real quick that I want you to pay attention to. Spine rotation. Okay. If we've got a player that's trying to produce power, typically what we'll see is after the top of the swing, when the player accelerates the pelvis against the torso, we're gonna see an increase in the separation between pelvis and torso after the top, okay? That's the player getting the pelvis started earlier than the club is setting at the top, creates some stretch. That stretch is gonna add extra energy into the player system, which is hopefully if they move their body efficiently going to produce more club head speed okay so that is something that you typically will see in a power swing and then the last one is in our wrists so when a player is trying to produce power okay generally we will see an increase in flexion and deviation okay so that's not to say that the player is going to be in flexion, like overall flexion, but I'm going into more flexion, right? So I'm losing extension from this point where it's at its lowest to this point where it's increasing or losing, it's increasing flexion, it's losing extension, right? But I'm still in extension when I get to impact. Some players will be, okay? Um, that's a that I think is a, a common misconception that all players are in flexion or a bowed lead wrist when they get to impact. That is incorrect. But what you do want to see is a pattern where players are going into flexion, not going into extension or the other way significantly prior to impact. So it's okay if I'm going into a little bit of extension like we see here, because this is my lead hand right that needs to stabilize for the club to get to the golf ball so it's a it's a common thing that the player is going to go into a, a little bit more extension right before impact but the overall pattern to see flexion being gained okay now in an ideal world depending upon what my body does maybe i get a little bit closer to zero which would be a completely flat lead wrist but the other thing you will see is an increase in ulnar deviation or an unhinging of the wrist as the player is coming into impact okay so that would be more of an unhinging or a shaft steepening coming into impact these are all for power okay now let's take a look at what the differences are when we go to more of a controlled wedge shot now remember this shot was a 54 degree wedge that flew 80 yards okay so if i go into my performance graphs you can see that we've got a, a, a different look to the graph itself in the areas that we talked about originally which are 
ex most specifically the acceleration rate. So one thing I wanted to point out that I hear a lot that at least in my perspective and the players that are uh, coaches that I've talked to that do a lot of data capture on short game. It's a common, let me just turn my camera on so I can uh, explain this to everybody here. Okay, so one of the things that I've heard a lot over the years that, what, again, what I have found and other coaches that I've talked to that do a lot of data capture on short game disproves a little bit is the transition sequence. So I've heard, I read and hear a lot about the transition sequence being the opposite, meaning if a power sequence was pelvis, torso, arm, club, that a, a, a wedge shot would be the opposite, whereas from the top, it would be club, arm, torso, pelvis last. That is not what we commonly see. What we do see is a difference in the acceleration rates or the loading pattern, sequential loading of the core, the shoulder, and the wrist. Okay, so we don't see a stretching occur but we might see more of a riding pattern or a fanning pattern occur because we're now trying to control the energy into the club, not maximize it, okay? So I will show you here. If we look back again at the transition sequence specifically, You can see that even though the lines are much closer together, so the timing is much closer together, but if we just look at the sequence itself, pelvis, torso, arm, club, the transition sequence order is still ground up, okay? And this is, this is very much in line what I have seen with my data captures over the years, as well as some of the top short game coaches that use 3D. So I want you to be aware of that so that we don't try and get a player to change this. It's what occurs with the segments after the change of direction that are much more important, okay? So if we look at that, When we look at the acceleration rates now, now remember this is in more of an 80 yard controlled wedge shot. So we don't see any stretch occurring at all between pelvis and torso. So if I take off the arm and the club, if I just looked at those two segments, they are what we call riding, all right? So the red's not on top of the green in terms of like having white space in between the two, but the lines are right on top of one another, which means they're moving at the same rate of speed. That is the next, uh, that is the next type of acceleration rate that is underneath or less efficient for producing power, okay? Power, like pure power would be if I accelerated the pelvis against the torso, created stretch through the core, these now are moving at the same rate of speed, right? So if I showed you kind of what that would look like. So if you look here again, if, if I get to the top and I stretch, okay, that's the red on top of the green. Then if I get to the top and both move together, okay, so the same rate of speed, the both, both the pelvis and the torso are moving together at the same rate of speed. That's what this would produce. Okay, so if I go ahead and take that off, and now if I put back on my lead arm, okay, take off the pelvis, now I see my lead arm actually moving faster than the torso. So this is the one that you're going to see very, very commonly when you get more towards a finesse shot. The segments of the arm and the hand are going to move faster than the chest. So the chest essentially supports the motion of an accelerating arm. 
okay? So this is one that I pay a lot of attention to. So it would look, when I get up to the top, okay, 80 yard wedge shot, I change directions in order, but then right after I change directions, the arm starts to accelerate much faster than the torso. So I'm not gonna get a look of that where the arm pins against the chest. If anything, I'm gonna see an arm that's kind of moving off the chest, okay? So I'm gonna loosen that, that connection between my arm, my bicep, and my pec, right? And that's kind of the look that you're gonna get when you hit those distance wedge shots. And that's what it would look like in the graph itself. And then if we look at the interaction between the arm and the hand, we get back to that riding look. Okay, so arm and hand riding till about just past the middle of the downswing. So they're moving at the same rate of speed as well. Okay, but if we look at the interaction between these two and the rest of the body, pelvis, torso, you can see we have, basically you can separate the two of them into two sets of riding, right? So you got the riding of the pelvis and the torso, then you got the riding of the arm and the hand, okay? So that's a more of a sequence that controls th that speed or acceleration rates that can control the energy into the club. And then the other thing I want you to pay attention to is, we could see a flat lining to the pelvis and a flat lining to the torso. So those don't decelerate as much when we get into more of a control shot, but you will see the lead arm decelerate, okay? But more commonly, you're gonna see most of that deceleration occur after impact. But it is gonna start to stabilize because you have to release the club, right? If not, you're gonna drag the handle and you're gonna have some trouble with contact. And you'll also have trouble controlling your distance as well. Okay, so if we look at the spine rotation and the wrist now compared to what we saw in a power shot, we now see we don't have any extra stretch occur after the top. It's just a rounded bottom, right? So that's where both segments are accelerating at the same rate of speed and you're not creating any extra separation between the pelvis and the torso. And then finally, if we look at the wrist angles, we now, because we're hitting more of a controlled shot, we have more extension than I did in my full shot, okay? So just be aware of that because as the more you get into a finesse shot, the more extension you should see your lead wrist in, okay? So now, uh, the one other thing to point out though is the pattern here, okay, of a little bit more flexion and a little bit more ulnar deviation still holds true for this particular shot, okay? So now let's go in and take a look at a pure finesse shot. Remember, this was a flop shot that went, you know, 15 feet, 20 feet straight up in the air. Okay, so now we have a much different look to the graph. The thing that I do want to point out again is even on a flop shot, We still have pelvis, torso, arm, club, okay? Transition sequence has not changed even on a shot that only flies 15 feet, okay? What does change drastically now 
are the acceleration rates. This would be your purest form of what we call fanning, which means it's a top-down acceleration pattern. So the thing that's moving the fastest as soon as it changed directions the whole time is the hand. The next fastest would be the arm, then the torso, then the pelvis. Okay, so that kind of looks like a fan there, like they're fanning apart after they change direction. So we don't even have any riding. So at no point in time were any of those two segments moving at the same rate of speed. The torso was always moving faster than the pelvis. The arm was always moving faster than the torso and the hand was always moving faster than the arm. Okay, so that's more of your finesse pattern, all right? The other thing I want you to take note of is pelvis flat lines all the way through finish, okay? Torso has a little bit of deceleration and so does the arm, but I want you to notice that the peaks of the arm and the torso are very, very close together, right? And I've got a ton of acceleration with the hand. So that's showing you that most of the energy that I'm using to control this shot is from my wrists my hands, okay? And the other segments are more of a support mechanism, okay? And then finally, if we look at spine rotation, we'd expect to see rounded bottom, right? Okay, so we don't have any additional stretch, but one of the things that you, you will see very commonly for a finesse shot and even a controlled wedge shot is the torso more open than the pelvis when you get to impact. That's where that red line is crossing through in the positive. So in this particular case, I've got about seven degrees more open with the torso rel uh, relative to the pelvis. And that's common for the shots as you get more towards a finesse shot. And then finally, my wrists, we can see very clearly that the pattern coming into impact is a bit different. I'm starting to lose that, that deviation, going more into radial again, and I'm definitely losing flexion coming into impact. Okay, and when I get to impact, I'm more at like 35 degrees of extension. Okay. So those are the things that we commonly see when we talk about the differences in the data of power to finesse. So let's go ahead and take a couple questions. Mason, how many questions do we have on that? We just have a couple on the graphs, Joe. Okay, let's go ahead and take those and then we'll go into biofeedback and sensor placement. All right, the first question is from Paul. Is the sequence the same on that 80 yard shot as it is for a 10 yard pitch shot? The transition sequence is, the thing that you'll see change are the acceleration rates. Okay, the next question is from Michael. Can you explain and compare, contrast, again, the spine angle graph between the power and finesse shot? Yes, so, on the power shot, two things that you'll see commonly in a good power sequence is after the top of the swing, right here, you'll see an increase in angle between pelvis rotation and torso rotation, and then you'll see even though the torso is moving uh, faster and closing the gap on the pelvis rapidly when it gets to impact, you'll see it cross in the negative values, which we see it crossing just in the negative values here. Okay, so less than I'd say 10 degrees difference, but not crossing in positive values for a power shot. Then if we see a finesse shot,
<clears throat> we will see no additional stretch between pelvis and torso. So there's no additional movement down like that last one after the top. And we're seeing it cross significantly in the positive values. Those are the two big differences that you, you will see. Okay, what do we got, Mason? All right, one more. Uh, this is from Anita. In the mid-range wedges, does the torso stabilize earlier in the downswing to let the arm and hands do most of the work and create speed? Good question. I think it's depending on how the player actually produces that, <clears throat> that speed. So if they are, what I mean by that, let's look here. So we can see that the torso, although it didn't decelerate, it stabilized a little bit later, okay? So the arm is actually gonna be accelerating, in my opinion, the way I look at it and train it, is that the arm is going to be accelerating more, equal to or more than the torso right after they change directions. Okay, now how much that occurs is uh, relevant to how long of a backswing they have. So you're going to have some players that have a longer backswing or more rotation away from the target, and they are more of what I call coasters, right? So they kind of keep a steady acceleration all the way through or you've got players that go shorter, and then you're gonna see a more distinct acceleration to the lead arm, okay? So that's kind of the differences that you'll, you'll see relative to the two amounts of rotation in the backswing. Is that it there, Mason? That was the last one? Uh, we have one more you could do, if you're ready. Okay. Yep. TPI says the sequence is lead arm, lower body, thorax, and clubs. That's from Jim. Lead arm, lower body, thorax, and clubs. So, it, again, depending upon how you measure, right, uh, uh, TPI measures with an electromagnetic system um, and also optical systems. I believe they have, they have every type of system, but I would want to know what system it was that measured the data. Um, I will tell you that they are probably speaking about the peak speed order, okay? So that would be the order of each segment peaking, okay? Relative to the order in which the segments are changing direction, right? That's, again, what I understand and what I've researched, as well as some of the coaches that I've talked to. I haven't talked to one yet that has measured consistently a transition sequence that is out of order from pelvis, torso, arm, club. Okay, good Mason? We have a few more, but I'll save them until the end, Joe. All right, so let's go in and take a look at a very simple biofeedback program that you can build to help your players start training controlled wedges, okay? So all we want to control when we're talking about biofeedback of controlled wedges is the biofeedback of the pelvis and the upper body rotation specifically. So you can load up rotation at address. Then I load up rotation at top. And then I'll do the same one again. And I'll change this from top to finish. Okay. Then when we come in to each position, what I'll do is I'll go back to their, now at finish, I set guy live, okay? So I look at their rotation for address from their graphs. So if we go back and I go to my controlled wedge shot, I'll come in here, I'll look at my pelvis angles, right around zero, maybe a little closed at address, and then a little bit open, okay, for my torso. So I'll relatively get them square at address. I'll look at where they were at the top values or their max values, 
okay? So there's the low point. I would take that number, which is 70. I would take this number, which is 50. And then I'd go back to my biofeedback. I'd go to my top activity. I'd go 70. Sorry, folks, it seems we're, that Joe is experiencing a glitch. Stand by one moment. All right, it looks like Joe's getting it back up and running. Mason, can you hear me? We can hear you, Joe. Great, okay. Where did you lose me, Mason? Uh, you were just about to hit the home button. Okay, so you didn't hear any of the story about the player that I was speaking about? I think we only heard a little piece of it. Okay, so where it's important to use this type of biofeedback to control your player's motion is the player that I was working with was getting really close to getting his first win, but what ended up happening in a number of tournaments that cost him actually the win was he'd get down to the 18th hole, he'd be in contention, right? He'd be tied for the lead, or in one case, he was in the lead, and he'd have a 70-yard wedge shot, why just coincidence that it happened to be a 70-yard wedge shot on multiple events, and in each case, he flew the green, and it cost him a bogey on each uh, in each particular tournament, and it cost him actually the win on both occasions. So what we did when we got back to kind of try and research why that was happening is for whatever reason, when he got to that 70-yard number, his sequence would change from a finesse sequence to a power sequence in terms of the pelvis leading the way or riding with the, pel with the torso. So it was putting extra energy into a system that was sending the ball obviously too far for what he was trying to intend it to fly. So all we did was we loaded up these three biofeedback points so that he knew what positions to get into then we focus purely on what segments to accelerate and when, and then we combine these three activities with a TrackMan uh, skills test that I built for different wedge distances. So we went 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and we use the biofeedback in conjunction with those uh, that combine test. And then I kid you not, in his very next tournament, he has a 70 yard or 75 yard wedge shot hits it to about three feet and wins the tournament, okay? So it was really kind of a mental block that he had for whatever reason, 60 yard shots, it was a controlled wedge shot sequence. 70 yard, something clicked in his brain and it went more towards 
full swing. But we would never have been able to identify that if we didn't measure him and see that in the kinematic sequence, his pelvis was creating some stretch against his torso when he did get the 70 yards. So again, just a little bit of a tidbit for you on how you can use a simple biofeedback three-point program like this and use it to really make a meaningful difference with your players. So let me finish by showing you where the sensors should be placed for lead arm and lead wrist. So for lead arm, we put it above the elbow. Okay, so just above the elbow and the sensor, when I'm calibrating, okay, if I'm calibrating square ball of you, the sensor is gonna be pointed straight down my target line or on the outside of my bicep. The wrist, now remember, these two should never be on at the same time, right? The sensor of the wrist is either on the upper arm or on the wrist, not both. So I would take this off if I'm not using that. And I'll put the wrist sensor on. Okay. Now, put the hand sensor on. Okay, so the wrist sensor should be as close to the hand sensor as possible without interfering with the hand sensor itself when I extend my wrist. Okay, so you can see I'm extending my wrist as much as it can go, and they are just about touching, but they're not interfering with one another. If the wrist was further down, I would not be able to extend my wrist as much as I am physically able to do, and therefore it could interfere with my motion. So they're gonna be about that far apart. I call that you know, three inches, four inches, something like that, okay? That's, and, and it's a right on top of the wrist. So if I extended my fingers, the, the hand sensor and the wrist sensor would be somewhat in line with one another. They don't have to be exactly perfect, but somewhere, in line with one another and in line with my middle finger. Okay, so that will cover all the content for today. Mason, let's take any other questions that we have. Okay, this question is from John. What is the sequence for a stack and tilt full wedge shot? Uh, the sequence, the transition sequence will be, still be the same. Um, I have not measured a swing where that sequence is different regardless of the method. Um, so I would tell you that the differences would start to lie in the acceleration rates um, of each segment, but really because of a, a wedge shot or a controlled wedge shot itself isn't gonna have as much of a pressure shift you typically will see very common to what I showed you today, regardless of the method, all right, or the model, right? You, you would see maybe some differences in how much the segments accelerate in terms of magnitude, or maybe what they're doing in, uh, in terms of linear motion, but you would see very common uh, kinematic sequences for what I showed you. Okay. Your next question is from Anita. Can you give us the difference between the deceleration sequence and power shots versus mid-range wedges? Yeah, so the biggest difference is going to be with a power shot, you are going to see deceleration. Now, depending upon the player's physical ability, that degree of deceleration is going to vary, but you will see deceleration of the pelvis, torso, arm right and obviously the club the hand's going to decelerate when you make impact versus a controlled shot where you will see less or no deceleration of the pelvis and the torso but you will still see deceleration of the lead arm okay this question is from giles 
What type of exercise do you use to train clients to understand difference between full swing and short game swing? So some of the activities that I'll use with a player is just, or you can classify them as exercises as well, would be just uh, disassociation, right? So just kind of like hip twister, um, where you're separating like your, your pelvis disassociation and your torso disassociation. Because that is going to be the biggest difference that you see between a power and a finesse shot. Whereas the pelvis di disassociates from the torso in transition, or if they're both going together. So just that simple hip twister or, or pelvis rotation when you keep the torso still is good for the player's awareness. Okay. Joe, would you mind turning your camera on for the questions? Sure. This one is from Mateo. Could you please tell us something about the bunker shot graph? Yeah, so the bunker shot graph is going to look, I'll show you my graphs here. The bunker shot graph, depending again on the distance of the bunker shot, is going to look very similar to this. Maybe not to this degree. You might see some more riding with the lead arm and the torso, or the lead arm and the torso, if anything. So you might see a little bit closer spacing between these two. But in terms of order and acceleration rates, exactly the same. Okay. This next one is from Rich. Could Joe go back to show us how he built the training for the 70-yard shot, how he built the program for his player? Yep. So I went into train. I loaded up three activities with rotation, address, top, which when I go to top, I went back to the graphs. So if the play, I would capture the player's graphs, and I would get their numbers on whatever launch monitor you use, when the ball flies the distance you want to train, you go into that graph, and then you go pull the numbers for the max rotation, okay, the lowest point of the rotation graph. So that's going to be more in before, it could be before the top, but it might be right at the top. So I would go into pelvis. So I go to my lowest point, which is like right about here, pull that number. Do the same thing for the torso, which is like right about at the top there. I would take those values and I'd plug them in for torso turn and pelvis turn. And then I would get the player into the biofeedback, right? So I'd launch right here. And then I would have them hit a shot and then hold their finish position. And when they are on their finish position, I would take, I would get them to rotation at finish and I'd hit set guide live. And now I'd have all three points where I want them. And then you can train those points and you can accompany that with a skills test on your launch monitor or you don't have to, one or the other. But you can train those three points and get them to get the tone at each phase, but produce the right amount of acceleration rates that you want to produce the ball flight that you're trying to achieve. All right, your next question is from Paul. Do you have a good drill to train deceleration? Yes, so my favorite drill for deceleration is, can you see me, Mason? We can see you. Okay. My favorite drill for deceleration is what I call drawback. So when you can even do these at a you know at a slower degree with wedge shots right so if this is your typical wedge shot swing okay i want you to get the player to set up hit the wedge shot and draw it back the club back okay so it would be a smaller drawback than a full swing but you'd still draw it back and that's going to help you decelerate the torso and the arm so that the club can start to unhinge and make good impact 
with that wedge shot. Now, why I like this specifically for wedge shots is because the way I train wedge shots is I want my player hitting more, uh, coming in more shallow, right? So that we can control the spin loft. So when we can control the angle of attack and can, can control the dynamic loft, we really can control the trajectory of the shot. So one of the things you're gonna commonly see players make an error on in their, in their wedge shots is they come in very steep, right? Handle gets ahead, right? They're de-lofting it. So they're either gonna come in super steep with deep divots, or they're gonna try and stand up out of it to control that, that spin loft. But that, that's more of a inefficient way to do it in my opinion. So if you get that player to produce the drawback, then you're stabilizing the lead arm faster, club's gonna unhinge, sooner and you're going to come in shallower and you're going to come in with more of a vertical shaft angle rather than one that's significantly leaning forward and exposing the leading edge okay great your next question is from inder what do you see in the best wedge players concerning rehinging or extending with the lead wrist after impact how quickly how much do they extend yeah, again, all depends on the shot. So if you've got a player that it's more of a it's more of a finesse shot, or let's call it a flop shot, right? Generally speaking, you're going to see more extension to start because the handle is going to be lower, right? And then from there, you're going to unhinge. And because you have more extension at that point, then when you start to unhinge or older deviate, because of the position of the wrist, you're going to go into extension a lot faster. And depending upon how much speed you're putting in, it's gonna go into extension even faster, okay? So very rarely do you wanna see, a, do you see a good player go here and then drag? for a flop shot, okay? That because what's, and what they're doing by leaning that shaft forward is they're actually decreasing the law, okay? And they're also orienting the face to the right. So they're gonna have trajectory or distance control issues and directional issues, right? That's what we see a lot of uh, higher handicappers do, even when they're trying to hit a flop shot, they go that direction, rather than letting the club work left, the handle work left so that the club head can work more down the line, but the face remaining square and the, the maximum amount of law. And the way we do that is by allowing the wrist to go into extension all the way through impact, right? So at no point do we want to move that way or bow the wrist, right? So Handle lower is going to set the wrist in more extension, which is going to help facilitate that. And then from there, we're going to keep that extension all the way through the shot, and we're going to try and increase the extension. So what I do with my players in terms of a feel is if we set up here, once they get to impact, I want them to feel like the shaft's lower than it originally started at address. And that's going to help them increase even more extension coming into impact. All right, okay. thank you, Joe. Next question is from Anita. Would it be safe to assume that in power shots, the pelvis accelerates and decelerates a lot more, thereby creating the speed? But in, a, uh, in finesse shots, it's the torso, arms, and hands that control the shot with the pelvis not doing as much. Um, I would say that's almost 100% correct, but in my opinion, it's not the torso either. It's more of the arm and, and hand. If anything, the torso and the pelvis will stabilize and support the motion, right? So for a finesse shot, most of the acceleration here is occurring with my lead arm and my hand right through the wrist. Very little do I control with the acceleration of the torso or the pelvis. Even if you accelerate the torso, you're going to add too much energy into the system for a pure finesse shot. 
So use this as a stabilizer and then accelerate the arm work, arm and hand. Okay. The next question is from Giles. What will be the difference for a 40-yard shot that will fly 30 and roll 10 and other 20 fly and 20-yard roll and 10-yard fly and 30-yard roll? Name so, yeah. So I think what the question is, what is the difference for a shot that flies less and ends up rolling more? So I will tell you that I don't know if we'll ever see a 20 yard shot with a wedge roll 20 yards or a 10 yard shot roll 30 yards, but I do get the point of you're gonna see slower speeds of the body, rotational. Slower rotational speeds are gonna mean less club head speed, which is gonna mean shorter carry distance, but what you'll probably end up seeing is a lower dynamic walk, so that when it does hit, it's going to roll a bit more. But again, the amounts, um, I think, are a little bit off. We're not going to see that extreme amount of roll for those distant shots. All right, thanks, Joe. Next one's from Jim. Does poor sequence cause too much lead hand impact extension or flexion? Poor sequence, so I'm assuming they're speaking to the transition sequence equal poor wrist angles, I will say absolutely, right? So the most common cause of a player that gets more scooping or, you know, anything that you can think in terms of a cast scoop, right? So scoop would be the most common for poor wrist angles because that means more extension than we actually want. Commonly coupled with from the top of the swing, I don't get my pelvis out in front. I don't have a good transition sequence. So the club starts to work outside my hands earlier, which are going to lead to more extension at impact. That doesn't happen 100% of the time, but it's a common pattern that we see. All right. And we are about at the top of the hour, Joe, and we've there's a few questions we didn't answer, but we could answer those in an email if you want to wrap it up. Sure. Yep. So anybody we didn't get to, we'll send an email out with those answers. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining. I know all of you are uh, probably still at home, so we're happy to do these for everybody to keep uh, keep productive. We're going to keep doing them. Again, as I mentioned, we will, uh, in the past, we will post these on our Facebook page. Please comment on them. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, any recommendations of things that you all would like to see. So keep those recommendations coming. Thank you for joining and see you next week.